Friends, at the end of his extraordinary conversation with Suzanne Nossel, Salman Rushdie challenged us to defend the First Amendment principle that we must protect the thought we hate, as Justice Holmes called it, and that in America, speech can only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. That's the principle that comes from the Brandenburg case. It was articulated by Brandeis in Whitney, and it makes America, as Salman Rushdie said, the most speech-protective country in the world. And on our first panel, we're going to explore the history of that shining idea with three of America's greatest historians of freedom of speech. And I'm so excited for the conversation. Uh, we have Jacob Machangama from the Future Free Speech Project, Akhil Amar from Yale Law School, Steve Solomon from NYU. And uh, Jacob Machangama, I want to jump right in and first say that your book, uh, free Speech, A History from Socrates to Social Media, I think is the clearest and best history of the evolution of the idea that I've read. And I want to begin by asking you, where did it come from? The phrase that we must have the freedom to speak as we will and think as we speak, you teach, came from Tacitus, the Roman historian, and it was then picked up by Spinoza, I learned from your book, and then articulated by Cato's letters, the great Whig revolutionary theorists who inspired Jefferson. Tell us more about that evolution, how it began in Athens and Rome, and then was picked up by the Enlightenment. Well, first of all, thanks for, for inviting me to here. I, I'm not an American, uh, so I feel like I've been given a, a wild card to the all-star First Amendment uh, game here in the US. So, <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a great honor to be here. Um, yeah, uh, the First Amendment was not the, the first invention of, of free speech. I, I would say we need to go back to the Athenian democracy, actually, uh, to find the origins of free speech. And the Athenians had two models of free speech. One was um, isagoria, meaning equality of political speech. All freeborn male citizens had a right to speak. And then parousia, which is a, a civic commitment to the tolerance of dissent, which permeated Athenian culture. And then you have the interesting Roman example uh, of Tacitus, but the Roman example is a bit more top-down elitist conception of free speech. So it was the elite, the well-educated elite, not the, the unwashed mob uh, who was supposed to exercise uh, free speech. But it was the Roman ideals that inspired, as you, as you mentioned, um, Cato's letters that, that came up with this great enlightenment meme that free speech is the great bulwark of liberty that made it into the Virginia Declaration, which made it into Madison's first draft of the, of the First Amendment, which even made it to radicals in, in, in Russia and was, was spread all over uh, colonial America and which also, I think, played a very important role in a, in a, in a case from 1735, the Sanger case, where a a printer who was the printer of the first opposition newspaper in, in the US was attacking the governor of New York, was, was put on trial for seditious libel. And normally it would have been an open and shut case, but the jury, uh, drunk on Cato's principles, um, was uh, decided to acquit him, uh, even though the common law was, was pretty clear. And since, then, since that case, it basically became almost impossible for colonial governors to, to use seditious libel trials uh, to, to convict people, to have juries convict them, because a culture of free speech had been inculcated. And I think that marks a huge difference from, from 17th century America, where you have more than 1,200 cases of people being prosecuted for speech, where here in Pennsylvania, uh, under William Penn, himself a former prisoner of conscience, you had pre-publication censorship, and a council in 1683 presided over by William Penn uh, sentenced an Anthony Weston to be lashed 30 times for you know, sedition speaking out against the government that, that William Penn presided over. So a huge shift between the 17th and the 18th century in the, in the understanding of the importance of free speech. And that sort of plays into developments leading up to the revolution and also afterwards. Oh, what a beautiful encapsulation of the history of free speech. That phrase, drunk on Cato's letters, just sums up how the colonists absorbed the spirit of liberty, and you you so well set the stage for our conversation. Akhil Amar, you uh, were my first uh, teacher of constitutional law and have kindled my understanding of the Constitution and that of so many Americans. And in his Virginia Bill for Religious Freedom, Thomas Jefferson offered four reasons for protecting free speech. 
First, that freedom of speech is an unalienable natural right that comes from God or nature, not government. Second, that free speech is necessary for the discovery and spread of political truth. Third, that free speech is necessary to hold public officials to account. And fourth, that it's necessary for democratic self-government. Now, not all of those were shared by the, all of the founders, and you've taught in your writings that it was really a concern about the collective uh, self-determination of the people that was at the centerpiece of so many of the founders, and that that evolved over the course of American history. But I want you to teach our friends um, how those Jeffersonian ideals were accepted or not by the different founders, and who were the leading voices in the founding on behalf of free speech? So Jeff, it's such a great honor to be back here. And yeah, you're right, way back when, you know, when I had black hair um, and you were just a lad, that's when we first <laughs> met. And, um, uh, and this is an amazing audience, but Salman Rushdie said one thing at the end that should you know, concern us all, look, look around, there are not enough young people in the room. We were young back then. We have to, we have to teach our children to, you know, to, to borrow from Crosby Sills, um, uh, <laughs> <coughs> Nash and Young. So here's the thing, because Jeff, you're right. This is an amazing place. Ladies and gentlemen, please look to your right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is the room where it happened and two things happened and they were different. You know, people can talk, but then are you willing to walk the walk, okay, the Declaration of Independence, drafted there, and here's the thing, wasn't really put to a vote. And then the Constitution is drafted there, and it is put to a vote, and the Athenians didn't put the Cleisthenic Constitution to a vote, and the Romans didn't, and this is astonishing, and that's amazing, and more people got to vote on when America became great. It's not perfect slavery and all the rest, but that's a moment in human history of, it's astonishing because an entire freaking continent is getting to vote on how they and their posterity are going to be governed. More people got to vote than ever before in human history. But they also spoke. So in, you actually have here an artifact, a newspaper publishing the proposed constitution. There is freedom of the press before there's a First Amendment, you see, because the press is free to publish this short little thing. It's short, not so judges can make stuff up, um, but so that ordinary people can actually read it start to finish and decide whether they're for it or against it. So that's freedom of the press before there's a First Amendment. They put it to a vote, two things, and then I'll shut up. The first thing ordinary people say is, like, dudes, you forgot the rights. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, securing their just powers from the extent of the government. You forgot the rights, says George Mason and other people, and they did. And in this ratification process, actually, the federal said, you're right, we goofed. So first thing we're going to do, we're going to add some amendments. And what do the amendments say? The people, the people, the people, the people, the people, as in the right of the people to petition and assemble, and the Second Amendment, and the Fourth and the Ninth and Tenth, because it's coming from this we the people act of ordainment and establishment, we're putting it to a vote, and ordinary people say, you know, we want rights, including rights to criticize, because that's what we're doing right now. Final point, the people who, you're allowed to oppose the Constitution, and you're not voted off the island. If you oppose the Declaration of Independence, you're almost not heard from, again, truth be told, because it's a war, and you're either for us or against us, and almost no one who opposes the Declaration goes on to anything, truthfully. You can oppose the Constitution, um, and like George Mason, we still have universities named after you, you see? And you can be President of the United States, James Monroe, Vice President of the United States, Elbridge Gerry, um, uh, George Clinton, Justice on the Supreme Court, Samuel Chase. So we don't just say it, we do it. The Bill of Rights comes from critics, comes from dissenters, comes bottom up from the people. So two amazing things happen there. Declaration, not bad. Constitution, even better, because more people got to vote, got to speak, got to criticize, and they were listened to and not voted off the island. And that's the story of the word the people um, in this amazing wall that you have up there. Beautiful. And you tell the story of the connection between we the people and the Constitution so well in your books. And Akhil, I just have to tell you what
an electric thrill it is to be talking about the First Amendment here with you and our friends gazing at the Independence Hall. It's just an extraordinarily sacred space to be talking about free speech. Steve Solomon, the man who convened all of us, your magnificent book, uh, Revolutionary Dissent, How the Founders' Generation Created the Freedom of Speech, tells the stories of jury trials like the Zenger trial, which Jacob Machangama mentioned, and other dissenters like McDougal, who uh, were uh, acquitted by jury nullification by liberty-loving juries that didn't want to enforce seditious libel laws. Tell us about how those revolutionary dissenters shaped the founders' conception yeah. of free speech. Well, thank, thank you, Jeff, very much. So the law of, the was, uh, of England, the common law of England that was adopted here, it came over the Atlantic, um, defined freedom of speech in a very limited way. What it, what it said was, it was a freedom from prior restraints. So the government could not shut down the newspaper, it could not license the newspaper. However, once you published, <laughs> you were responsible for what you published. And in terms of what we're talking about today, the concern was criticism of the government. And that's what we call seditious libel. It's the criminalization of criticism of the government. That system was here. Now, in August of 1765, after the passage of the Stamp Act, which taxed Americans without their consent, something happened in Boston. They put up, they, they dedicated a liberty tree. And half the town came up, came out, and they heard speeches all day. There were effigies hanging of the British prime minister. And it energized the opposition. This was carried by newspapers all throughout the colonies. And one by one, um, all these cities put up their own liberty poles, liberty trees. And debate was energized. And it was opposition to British taxes without consent. And other things too, like general warrants. And the liberty trees were just one thing. People started writing pamphlets, broadsides. They, they, they wrote poems. They wrote plays. They were all criticizing Britain for their policies. Now, at least technically, all, all of this literature, all this action was, was a violation of seditious libel. Jacob made mention of, of the Zenger case. That was 1735. Now go forward to the 1760s. The British aren't really happy about all this criticism. And they start to, to try to use their seditious libel laws against the colonists. But they're not successful. Because in order to bring a case, you've got to convince a grand jury to indict. They couldn't do that. Some examples. The Boston Gazette, the most radical paper in America, published you know, Samuel Adams. They published all kinds of revolutionary literature. The uh, governor tried four times to get indictments. All four times the grand jury said no. Then he went to the General Assembly of Massachusetts, tried to get action there. They came back and said no, and said the freedom of the press was a bulwark of liberty. He moved south to New York City. You mentioned Alexander McDougall. Alexander McDougall was a wealthy merchant. He, he circulated a broadside from the Sun of Liberty. He was identified as, as, the, uh, as the writer. Um, they were unable to, to convict him, again, because of the popular resistance to seditious libel. Now, I have one, one more example because it shows just how desperate the colonial governors were, the royal governors. Go down again a little bit south to Virginia, Governor Dunmore. 1775, conflict has already broken out at Lexington and Concord. He flees Williamsburg, gets on a man of war, British man of war in Chesapeake Bay, and he's, he's still criticized, he's suffering the slings of and arrows of outrageous pamphlets. <laughs> and he's very unhappy. He's, he's like, well, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be able to indict these 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 newspaper publishers. But he has another idea. One morning he sends a dozen of his 
soldiers on a boat off the man of war into, into Norfolk, and they go to the, to the offices of the Norfolk intelligencer, and they take the printing press, and they take it out to the man of war. Not only do they shut down the Norfolk paper, very critical of him, but then they start publishing all kinds of propaganda in favor of the, of the king. So that's the desperation that they had. How could they stop the criticism? It got to the point where the only way to stop it was to take this kind of radical action. Now, there's uh, coming out of this period, I, I, I have to quote Samuel Adams, who I think was, you know, maybe said it best. Listen to this quote. There is nothing so terrible to tyrants as a free press. There's nothing so terrible to tyrants as a free press. You can see that today, right? I mean, Salman talked about authoritarianism. That's what authoritarians do. They try to shut down the press. He saw that, and that's where we are. Uh, Steve, you just talked about the history of sedition, and Jacob, I want to ask you about the history of sedition. So as Steve and Akil mentioned, the Sedition Acts of 1798 tried to criminalize any uh, criticism of the Federalist President John Adams, but not the Republican Vice President Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson and Madison objected to the Sedition Acts uh, on grounds of federalism. They said that uh, c Congress couldn't exercise that power, reserving the possibility that the states might. But in their great dissents in the 1920s, Brandeis and Holmes disagreed and came up with the idea that speech should only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence and merely causing offense against the authorities was not enough. So I wanna ask you, what's the history of that principle that you can only restrict speech if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence? Was it uh, original with Holmes and Brandeis or are there roots back in ancient times? Well, I, I want to take a step back first with the Sedition Act of, of 1798 because I think that really demonstrates that the sort of two conceptions of egalitarian and elitist free speech survived into to American history. So you see that suddenly with the Sedition Act, suddenly federalists are saying, well, the first, yes, we've adopted the First Amendment, but basically we have a Blackstonian conception of free speech, you know, prior constraints, but if you say something against the government, you know, you can, you can go to jail. Whereas as, as Madison, at least, you know, if you read his report of, of 1800, he, he writes a meticulous, argue, uh, detailed argument in, in favor of why the First Amendment protects against seditious libel. And he specifically distinguishes America from Britain, where Britain has a, a much more elitist system. Uh, America uh, is uh, governed by the people, and therefore, you know, seditious libel laws uh, violate that. So, so that's, that, that, that's important. I think those two conceptions are with us today. Even in the age of social media, we see sort of uh, these two uh, conceptions. But the idea that, um, you know, that words should only be uh, punishable when they, um, when they incite to violence, or at least when they, uh, you know, lead to acts is something that you see in Tacitus. Mm. It's something that you see uh, in, Sp in, in, in Spinoza. Mm. And of course, they are uh, crystallized uh, very clearly in, in Brandenburg, uh, which uh, is a, a decision which I think a lot of people outside America don't understand, uh, including in my country. My home country, home country, Denmark, is right now reintroducing a blasphemy ban uh, because of people on the far right have been burning Qurans in, uh, in, in public. So now the, the government is passing a law which says that the improper treatment of religious objects um, will be punishable with prison of up to two years under a chapter in our criminal law which punishes treason and threats to national security. And you know, it was only in 2017 that the Danish government uh, abolished it, its, its blasphemy ban. So I think that principle really is central to the principle that Salman also talked about, that if you are serious about defending speech for those that you don't like, you really need to have very, very clear principle, because otherwise human beings are experts at convincing themselves, coming up with elaborate narratives of why free speech is really important, but the communists 
the abolitionists, the women's rights activists, the gay rights activists are actually undermining free speech or undermining the, the, the values on which you know, democracy depend, and therefore they have to be uh, criminalized. So I, th so I personally am a big fan of, 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 of Brandenburg, uh, and I wish <laughs> that principle was more universally observed, but that's not the world we live in. Yes, we must teach that Brandenburg principle as part of our convening today. Speech can only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. Not if it might cause a possible bad act in the future, not if it might cause offense, not if it could possibly incite people to affiliate with others who might argue. No, it has to be intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. And it's the most speech protective principle in the world and so interesting to learn that it has roots in Tacitus and Spinoza. Akhil, help us understand um, exactly where it came from in the thoughts of the founders. Jacob mentioned Madison's report of 1800. Is that the crystallization of the libertarian conception that speech can only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence? And then how did it evolve during the Civil War and finally make its way to, Brand to Brandeis and Holmes and Brandenburg? Yeah, thanks for mentioning the Civil War because it's important. Um, so here's... <laughs> No I, I, I actually, <laughs> this was not intentional. I get all my clothes from uh, downstairs, you know, my ties and things like that. But it turns out, I, I think I'm wearing my Abraham Lincoln socks today. <laughs> I, that wasn't, you know, for this event, but it, um, so, um, and I do have my We the People socks from downstairs. They're very nice and, and all, they have great ties here. Here's the point. Salman Rushdie told you, because he's you know, one of the world's greatest writers about storytelling and narrative. Okay, narratives are very powerful. Here's why we have a particular challenge, because we're the one nation in the world where the great-grandchildren of all the other continents actually come together. And that puts real cha um, strains on us because we don't have race in common. We don't have religion in common, not even quite language. Some of our forebears came here hundreds of years ago in chains, others hundreds of years ago with bull whips in their hands, and others came yesterday. So the only thing that we have in common is actually our constitution and our narrative. And the big narrative, Brandenburg is good and Brandeis is good and all the rest, but here's the big narrative. You need to understand the American Revolution, which gives us the Declaration of the Constitution, and the American Civil War, which gives us the 14th Amendment. That's big picture, that's what we Americans have in common. We have in common George Washington, uh, and Abe Lincoln especially, more than anyone else. So, he told you, and he's right, the Brits, they're so stupid, they actually, it's not just that they put a tax, you know, the Americans haven't voted for it, they put a tax on paper in the Stamp Act, that's a tax on newspapers, and who's not gonna like that? The newspapers, okay? <laughs> Don't put a tax on newspapers, because they're gonna push back, that's not very smart, and that's the American Revolution, you see. And there's, anxiety about this new central government that's being created. And so the first thing they said, where's the rights? And the central government, you see, can't restrict stuff. Congress shall make no law. And John Adams you know, wasn't quite there for all of this. He, um, and he kind of missed the memo. And so he makes it a crime to criticize Donald Trump, I mean, to criticize um, John Adams, excuse me. Um, and, um, uh, and he's thrown out on his ass by the American people. He's the only early president who is, okay? Because he doesn't get it. But today, threats come not just from um, religious extremism, as Salman Rushdie said, and maybe not just from certain media outlets that have monopolies, um, but from state and local governments. Think about, actually, the threats today. And this one isn't going to help you very much. It says, Congress shall make no law. Well, there's another war in America, because the Revolutionary War are locals against the central government. And we like local juries and local militias even, and that's our Bill of Rights. Congress shall make no law in the 10th Amendment, and militias and juries in the 5th Amendment grand jury, 6th Amendment trial jury, 7th Amendment civil jury. That's Steve's story. It's about revolutionary dissent, but the rights actually originally don't apply against states and localities. And that's a mistake, because states and localities start to suppress, and Jefferson doesn't fully get it, 
And it's a, it's a capital offense in many states to criticize slavery. I'm not making that up. A, a capital offense. The Republican Party is outlawed in the Deep South in the 1850s more than the Communist Party ever was in the 1950s. Abraham Lincoln's name is not allowed to be on the ballot, in effect. South of Virginia gets a zero popular, not electoral, zero, zero. You can look it up in Wikipedia. Zero popular votes south of Virginia because we've outlawed discourse. And a great war comes as a result of this and, and in the aftermath we insist never again no state can make or enforce any law which abridges these fundamental rights. See, shall make no law abridged. That's there but that's limiting the federal government. Now the 14th Amendment says no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge, shall make no law abridge, the same words as you see up there, but states and localities are limited. That's because of Lincoln, that's because of the Civil War. So, final sentence, the only thing we have in common is our Constitution and our national narrative. And our kids don't learn it, they don't know their presidents, they don't know the history of the Revolution and the Civil War, which give us the Bill of Rights and the 14th Amendment, and if we don't know that, we die. Okay, so, so that's our narrative and we need great storytellers to tell that story and when they come here they begin to learn that story, Jeff. Um, but we have to bring the children here, we really do. That's the national narrative that needs to be taught. Absolutely, Akil, and it's so exciting to think of bringing all those school kids to stand in this space, to see the tablet, and then to see that gallery, and to see uh, Brandeis' original opinion, and George Washington's letter to the uh, Quakers, and Mary Beth Tinker's armband, and it's, it's just a, a, a privilege to be able to inspire the next generation. Steve Solomon, as, as Akil and, and Jacob have said, um, many of the founders were not especially committed to a libertarian conception of freedom of speech. Jefferson was more concerned about keeping the federal government out of prosecuting sedition, but he himself authorized state sedition prosecutions. Hamilton uh, would have allowed prosecution of uh, laws with bad tendency after the facts. Did any of those juries that acquitted um, accused critics of the government in the colonial era articulate the idea that speech was a natural right that should only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence, or was that really just crystallized later? The juries themselves did not articulate that, because that's not what juries do. They come back with guilty and not guilty. Grand juries either indict or don't indict, so they don't come out with a, necessarily with reasons for it. But the founders did. So in, the, in, the, in their papers, in their essays, in their, um, their pamphlets, and there were so many of them, they articulated, they went back to the Enlightenment philosophers, John Locke, natural rights. And um, they also worked from the bills of rights that the states had passed, which nine of the 11 bills of rights included the right to a free press. And they called it, it wasn't just the right to a free press, it was, they called it the bulwark of liberty. Now, I think that gives us some clues because if it was just one of a lot of other rights, they would just say freedom of the press. What they saw was the press as a bulwark of liberty, meaning that you can't protect all the other rights if you don't have a free press. And so they were also concerned about general warrants. They were concerned about their jury, uh, the rights to a jury trial being taken away. Without the right to protest, Without the right to protest, you can't protect the other rights. You're silenced, and so you lose the other rights by not being able to stand up to them. And so there are clues. There was no committee that sat down and said, here's what we mean by freedom of speech and freedom of the press. There's no committee, but I think what you try to do is, is draw from the writings and their actions, and what did they actually understand the concept to mean? And you take that from all the debates that went on, you know, it's especially in the ratification period. Almost, I, I would say probably all of the ratification um, 
conventions involved a lot of talk about freedom of speech and freedom of the press. So, um, yeah, uh, speech is the bulwark of every other right. It's so important to remember. We just have time for one final round of, of concluding thoughts. Salman Rushdie challenged us to debate the idea that the American principle, that free speech should only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence, is more persuasive, more worthy of respect, better than the view embraced by all other Western democracies uh, in, in Europe and around the world, uh, that speech can be banned if it offends dignity uh, and uh, if it uh, offends honor. Jacob Machangama, tell us about the competing European view. It, it has its roots in earliest European history. It was crystallized in the French Revolution. It was embraced in Weimar Germany and is rampant in Europe today so that our audience understands how different it is from the American view. Yeah, so the classic example would be so-called hate speech laws. So every European democracies have laws that, for instance, criminalize the, um, making hateful uh, statements about specific groups, whether on, based on race or ethnicity uh, or religion. And if you want to steel man the case for that, well, then it, the argument goes, well, uh, the Nazis came into power through democratic means, and therefore, uh, democracies have to be intolerant of uh, intolerance uh, because otherwise totalitarian movements will abuse democracy and free speech to abolish uh, democracy itself. Uh, and you could say that, well, you know, to those of us who are more persuaded by the American approach, you could say, well, European democracies since World War II have been prosperous, stable, you have uh, robust political debate, and that, so what's, what's the danger? Yes, there might be, sometimes someone might be imprisoned or fined for speech that we would consider that should be protected, but all in all, you know, things ha have gone well. But, I, you know, my counter-argument is what I call the Weimar fallacy. So the idea that Weimar Germany is an argument in favor of restricting free speech, I think, rests on pretty shaky historical grounds because the short-lived Weimar democracy between 1918 and 1933, actually banned a lot of speech, including those of Nazis. Um, and, um, and ultimately, the, the most dangerous thing about it was that the Nazis were able to rely on the emergency laws that were supposed to protect democracy, to abolish democracy. So the emergency con uh, provision in the Weimar Constitution uh, allowed the president to uh, um, suspend all civil liberties. And what happened after the, 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 um, the the fire in the Reichstag was that Hitler leaned on President Hindenburg to suspend all liberties, and that paved the way to give legal backing to basically the establishment of a totalitarian one-party state uh, that was entrenched within six months. Um, so, so I think historically that's that's not a, a great argument. Of course, I can understand. You know, if I was the Chancellor of Germany, could I go out tomorrow and sign a law saying, "Yes, now." Holocaust denial is protected speech and Nazis can walk in the streets. That's not feasible from a, from a German uh, point of view, uh, just like morally, historically, you couldn't do it. So I could understand why the Germans would not do it, but I, 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 I just don't think the historical arguments uh, are strong for that approach, which is why I uh, prefer the American one. But I also want to say that free, spe free speech is a, it's a continuous experiment, right? There's no, there's no guarantee that free speech will always uh, ensure tolerance and, and peace and, and prosperity. I, I, I think that his, historically, you know, the case for, for free speech is pretty good, but there's no guarantee that it, that will always be the case going forward. But I, if I was to sort of bet, I would bet on free speech over censorship <laughs> going forward. Akil, in just a, just a few sentences, because we're, we're uh, almost out of time, you are you've described yourself as an American exceptionalist when it comes to free speech. Uh, tell our friends why you believe that the American approach to free speech is better than all other approaches. Well, at our best, we've produced um, a Lincoln, um, and I don't think any other country has. Um, um, my parents came from India here, and those of us who are here don't want to go to India. Um, so, um, uh, now, what I do want to say is there, there are threats posed by the government, by Congress, we talked about that, 
by states and localities. We talked about that, but some of the deepest threats are within ourselves because I think there's not just a freedom of speech, there's a duty to listen. Um, and it's, you can't easily enforce that, but we have obligations to try to listen to our fellow citizens, and we're failing in that. And Nadine, my friend Nadine is nodding her head, and I was gonna give her a shout out anyway, but she is nodding her head because she embodies this. It's so hard every day for me to actually read all the major networks, but I do. It's my kind of obligation as a citizen to try to hear folks across the world. No law can enforce this. This has to come from within, but if we stop talking to each other, okay, and, and again, this is the spirit of these um, amendments. Th these amendments and these rules apply only against the government, okay? But the culture of freedom of speech, it's an amazing newspaper culture in America, and people are actually reading opposing newspapers, and we're not doing that so much anymore. But at our best, we have, and we did produce, and yes, there was a civil war afterward, and that should be sobering to us. But I would say, you know, if you are an American exceptionist, we put the thing to a vote, not 1776, but 1787. We didn't throw the critics off the island. We listened to them. Um, and then we allowed repression again, um, but we, we elected a Lincoln who very much actually who wins because of debates, open debates. They're called the Lincoln-Douglas debates, covered in newspapers, and people are hearing both sides, and then voting. That's how, actually, we did it at our best. That was more than a few sentences. My apologies. Beautiful. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wonderful. Steve Solomon, the last word in this great discussion is to you. You convened us for this National First Amendment Summit. What is the one thing about the First Amendment that you want our audience to think about as we conclude this panel? Yes, yeah, so I would ask you very conveniently that the First Amendment is up there. Let's, let's look at it and see how it's laid out because I think this is a narrative of democracy and, and representative government. These are 45 words that are critical. So it starts with two religion clauses which ask people, protect people, when they, in their inner self, the freedom of thought, the freedom of conscience, and they, they think about sort of their place in, universe, in the universe and perhaps their relationship to a higher power. That's the, that's the inner self. Look at the next right. We emerge from our, from our inner self and we are protected in the freedom of speech whereby we are talking about ideas and political ideas and some of them may be very controversial. That's all well and good, but it doesn't do much politically unless you can get it out to a lot of people. And so the next right the founders protected is freedom of the press, the institutional means of spreading ideas that people have among themselves. Now, once you do that, you spread these ideas across the country, the next step that's protected is you, get a lo you, you assemble with like-minded people for political purposes. And that's you know, in the streets, around, and back then it was back in liberty trees and so forth. And so you bring together a political movement. For what purpose? To petition the government for a redress of grievances. And that's the final right. So it's not just a bunch of rights that are kind of put together, but there's a narrative of democracy from the beginning to actual political change. And the speech and press sit there right in the middle and are absolutely critical to that process. Beautiful. <laughs> For having educated us about the five freedoms of the First Amendment, please thank our panelists and please welcome our next panelists. As they come up, we are so honored to have Bruce Brown from the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, and he will be moderating our conversation with